muy buenos días. Te saluda Larry Rubin. Soy el presidente de la American Society. El American Society se fundó en 1942 con el propósito de unificar a toda la comunidad americana en México. Fundada por el entonces embajador George S. Messersmith y líderes de la comunidad americana, se creó esta organización para también representar a los americanos viviendo en México y las organizaciones, al igual que las compañías en este país. Hoy, el American Society representa a dos millones de norteamericanos viviendo en México, miles de empresas que crean buen empleo bien pagado y también a cientos de asociaciones no lucrativas que apoyan a mexicanos y mexicanas. Tenemos el día de hoy a dos muy especiales invitados que nos platicarán de servicios que da la embajada, particularmente en el primer segmento hablaremos de servicios que se le dan a los norteamericanos, a los estadounidenses viviendo en México, los cuales son variados y muchísimos. Ya escucharemos de Becky Thurman, eh, quien se encarga de, eh, de todos esos servicios para los norteamericanos. Y, y también platicaremos con David McCauley, que es el cónsul general de la Ciudad de México, para platicarnos del servicio de visas. Hi, I'm Larry Rubin, president of the American Society of Mexico. Uh, first off, I'd, I'd like to thank you for watching us today and, and definitely for following the American Society on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, LinkedIn, and, uh, and, and naturally uh, following everything we do on, on Facebook. A uh, little bit about the American Society. It was born in, in it was founded in 1942 by a group of Americans and uh, former Ambassador George S. Messersmith, additionally, additionally with, with a number of American leaders of the time. And since then, the American Society has uh, done a number of events and always close to the community, uh, looking for ways of, of building stronger ties between Mexico and the U.S. And, uh, and, and representing Americans in Mexico. Today, the American Society has over 100 nonprofit associations and a number of Mexicans, Americans, and people of all nationalities. With that said, we're very excited today to have uh, two very special guests from the U.S. Embassy to talk about what the U.S. Embassy does for Americans. First off, someone that you've probably seen in our 4th of July events and, and other events that the American Society has had in the past, and that's David McCauley. He's our Consul, Consul General for Mexico City, and he is also accompanied with, uh, with, with Becky Thurman, who's the, the manager of ACS Operations. David, Becky, thank you for being with us today. Great to be here, Larry. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Likewise, likewise, thank you. And, and uh, David, Becky, if you'd like to start and tell us, tell us more about ACS uh, that, uh, that probably a lot of people uh, don't know, but uh, ACS is, is always very active. So, so, so please go ahead, thank you. Go ahead, Becky. Okay, yeah, I can take that one. Uh, yeah, we have a, a very busy active ACS unit here, one of the busiest in the world. I think what most of you are familiar with are probably things like our passport services. So we help uh, thousands of people every year to renew their passports, both people who live here and those who are passing through and for some reason perhaps need an emergency or a renewal of their passport. Um, we, we, we call it kind of a birth to death service as we help individuals whose children were born um, overseas uh, to register them as United States citizens. And we issue consular reports of birth abroad to those children as well. Um, in the sad event that a U.S. citizen passes away overseas, we also provide services, um, assistance to their family in helping to handle arrangements or repatriate um, their deceased loved one's remains if necessary and to obtain the right documentation that helps to settle affairs. Uh, we help with a number of children's issues um, in the unfortunate event that, uh, that a child is abducted by, by their parent overseas, we can provide assistance um, Kind of to all the parties and helping make sure that they're abiding by the legal uh, frameworks that exist to, to watch out for that child's welfare. We also provide information to individuals who are considering intercountry adoption. When an American citizen is arrested overseas, this is probably, I would imagine, one of the parts that, uh, that, that your clients or your uh, organization is maybe less familiar with, I would imagine. <laughs> but if an American is arrested overseas, we visit that individual. Um, and we make sure that they're being treated fairly, that they have the um, things that they need to stay safe and healthy, um, and access uh, 
to their family members um, and information about the legal system. Um, Another place that we help out, the other kind of side of the legal equation is assisting Americans who've been victims of crime overseas. Um, in the unfortunate event that happens, we might help them get in touch with police, file police reports, uh, follow up on their case with local officials, um, and perhaps even connect them with victims assistance resources. Um, sometimes individuals find themselves overseas and unable to get back home um, due to logistical or financial challenges. So we also provide repatriation assistance in those sorts of situations. On a broader scale, American Citizen Services um, does that as well in events of natural disasters or other sorts of um, large scale events that require evacuating individuals. Fortunately, that hasn't been something we've had to do in Mexico for a few years, um, but I'm sure some of you have seen the news stories of the sorts of assistance that our colleagues in many countries around the world have been doing in light of the, the COVID-19 pandemic um, and helping Americans return home. Um, we can connect people with legal resources, medical resources. Um, while we don't provide those things directly, we maintain lists of resources and, and help connect American citizens to those overseas. Um, we also provide notarial services, which is less glamorous, but super important uh, to folks who need to get legal issues taken care of overseas. And we work really closely with our colleagues in the Federal Benefits Unit um, to connect Americans overseas to the various benefit programs they might be able to take advantage of, um, IRS services, Social Security, Veterans Affairs. And uh, one of the very, very most important is, is our voting services, of course. And I know that the American society is very involved in that part of the democratic process. And uh, we're, we're really happy to have partners like that. Um, we want to get information to Americans overseas to make sure that they understand how to vote from overseas. Uh, we provide training um, as well as services in helping Americans return their ballots back to the US once they've been filled out. I think that's just about all I can think of off, off the top of my head. David, do you have anything else I missed? No, I think that's a pretty comprehensive summary of uh, all the services that you and your team provide. It sounds like a lot, it is. Um, well, that's just, why we're so busy. <laughs> <laughs> from the outside, it's true for our embassy, it's uh, true for all our embassies around the world that uh, protecting the uh, health, safe, safety, and interests of American citizens overseas is our top priority. That always has been, and it, uh, it always will be. And that's uh, certainly true during this time of global pandemic. Uh, Becky and I are very proud of our teams around the world. We've, I think uh, the last number I saw was about 100,000 Americans have been uh, safely brought back home uh, with the assistance of consular officers in the field. So thankfully, uh, uh, commercial flights here during COVID-19 have uh, continued and people have been able to get home who wanted to go back to the United States. But uh, for many of our, uh, our fellow citizens overseas, that was not a possibility. So it was really down to the State Department uh, helping them get home. So we're very proud of the efforts that they made. Wonderful. And, and, and additionally, all these services or some of these services are provided also in, uh, in the consulates around the country, right? Right. So we are uh, actually go ahead. I can describe. Oh, no, no. I mean, you're right. In, in our, our nine other consulates around the rest of Mexico, we provide all those same services I just um, explained, with the exception of uh, we don't have an in-house federal benefits unit at all of them only at a, at a few of them, but uh, there's, there's always somebody in one of the other offices that can assist if someone is looking for federal benefits assistance at a consulate that doesn't have it. Where it's a little different is our consular agencies. They do provide more limited services. They take in passport applications and provide emergency assistance, um, but they don't have the, quite the same breadth as, as a consular section in the consulate or an embassy. And, and how do Americans, if they want one of these services, uh, do they just, go there or do they do an appointment? How, how is that usually managed? A little of both. Um, so it sort of depends what you need. Um, individuals who need routine services uh, typically make appointments with us. So if you need your passport renewed, you need a notarial service to register the birth of an American citizen child overseas, uh, we typically ask people to make appointments. Under normal circumstances, you can do that via our website. Under our current situation, we're only handling emergency appointments um, for people who need these services urgently. So we're asking people who need um, to come in to make appointments via email at our ACS Mexico City at state.gov email address um, or by calling the embassy and uh, indicating what they need. Um, of course, in emergency circumstances, people walk in all the time and we'll help individuals who, who come to us for uh, for in emergency circumstances uh, during business hours. After hours, we're always available 24 seven. 
everywhere around the country as well via our duty officer um, who can connect to the American Citizen Services uh, units for anyone who needs urgent after hours or holiday assistance. Wonderful. That, that's great. And, and, and now with, obviously with, with a pandemic, there's, there's uh, it, it, for, for the regular services, any, any ideas as to when those will, 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 uh, will renew again in, 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 a, in a normal fashion, a couple of months maybe? Uh, any ideas that, that, that you have in terms of, of when that will happen? It's, it's the million dollar question, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> for American Citizen Services, for our visa services, and all the other services and operations of, the, uh, of, the, of our mission here. Uh, we don't know. I mean, like everyone else, uh, we, we are looking very closely at, um, at COVID-19 and it's, uh, at the situation here in Mexico on the ground in terms of the number of cases, in terms of hospitalization, many other factors. We're looking at the guidance that is being put out by public health authorities here uh, in individual states. Um, so, you know, our answer is we wish we could give people a better answer. Um, mm -hmm. We're closed, right? We are continuing to provide emergency services, as Becky man, uh, mentioned, including passports uh, for those that have urgent travel needs or need to document their stay somehow here in Mexico. Uh, on the visa front, we've also continued to issue some emergency categories of visas, especially those who, have, uh, who are working in the United States in, in some way to fight against COVID-19 or to support uh, the U.S. during this difficult time. That includes agricultural workers. You might have read about, maybe it's covered in the media, some of our H-2 uh, workers, uh, uh, essential workers. So that work has gone on, but we've had to find ways to do it safely uh, and remotely. Um, and that's our, our uh, the thing that's most important for us, of course, is the, the health and safety of our employees and the people that visit our facilities across the country. So uh, we do have a plan uh, around the world. State Department has a plan. A framework really for bringing people back into the office. As you can see, we're not in the office. I don't think, Becky, you're in the office. You're, you're I, I am in the office today. You're in the but office, but that is your office. I couldn't tell. But, but I'm one of just a few. <laughs> <laughs> so she's there to help with the emergency cases that walk in. Uh, but m many of us are either rotating in and out of the office or are working from home. Um, the State Department also authorized departure for many of our employees who are at higher risk of uh, having a negative outcome. Um, due to exposure to COVID-19, some return to the United States. We'll eventually get everybody back. Uh, we'll eventually uh, restore operations as uh, hopefully as close to as uh, they, normal as they were before COVID-19, uh, but we'll certainly be taking into account uh, people's uh, safety and security. So it may look different for some time, but I, we really just don't know when we're going to, to be able to start again. And we're getting that question a lot from, from people for visas, for example. We know, we know people are very eager to know uh, for their kids who may be studying in the United States when and if we'll be uh, issuing student visas or exchange uh, visas. Um, and we don't know. We can tell you it's a priority for us to do so, uh, but we're going to do it in a coordinated effort with Washington around the world and dependent on the circumstances on the ground. Definitely. And, and, and if, we, if we could, uh, uh, obviously one of the services that you provide is, is voter assistance, and, and that's coming up very, very soon. But can you give us a 360 in terms of uh, what an American needs to do to vote from, uh, from Mexico? Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, you know, there's kind of two parts there, right? First, there's making sure you're registered to vote. And second of all, there's making sure that you request your ballot and are able to return it. So one of, we, we do a few of our, our principal priorities, obviously. Um, we provide a few different services for American citizens overseas who are looking to vote. One, we wanna help you make sure that you are registered to vote. And two, uh, we assist people with uh, figuring out how to get your ballot overseas and then return it uh, to your, your uh, voting place. So we typically refer people to the Federal Voting Assistance Program, um, which has a great, easy to use website at fvap.gov. Um, and there people can order a ballot. Um, they can simultaneously order a ballot and register to vote if they're not. They can get information about uh, how to register to vote if you haven't ever done it before or lived in the United States, which is uh, something that's allowed in many states. Um, and we also uh, provide, there's also on that website information on how to get a prepaid ballot return envelope. So once someone's ordered their ballot and it's either come to them by email or in person um, via mail, they can complete that ballot and they can either return it directly, uh, depending on your state, you might be able to do that by email, online, by fax, or in, um, in person. Um, 
once you have it completed, if you need to return it in person or by mail, uh, the embassy can assist you with that. Um, in normal times, we, we allow people to drop them off uh, in in-person drop-off. Under the current circumstances, we're not doing in-person drop-off at this moment at our consulates and embassies uh, because of the safety concerns about having that much in-person contact. However, individuals who've completed a ballot, um, whether that be for primaries or in, in the general elections later on, they can mail their ballot to uh, the embassy or consulate closest to them, um, and we can return it via our diplomatic pouch um, to the U.S. sorting facility, which will then forward it, uh, assuming it has the right postage, um, to their, their voting place. Um, so our, our voting assistance is, program is still open. Um, it's just under a little bit of a, a different setup because of the, the pandemic situation. And, and I think something really important to note, and, and most Americans do know this, but uh, you probably get one or uh, one or two people coming in on November 3rd thinking that I'll just go drop off my, my vote and that doesn't happen. That's not the way it, it should be, right? Right. That's an excellent point. Thanks for bringing it up, Larry. Yeah, just like everything we do um, overseas, uh, it often takes more time, right? So if individuals are looking to utilize uh, either directly mailing their ballot back to their voting place in the United States or, or bringing it to um, the embassy or consulate close to them for us to mail on your behalf, you want to give yourself some extra time. Depending on where it's being mailed from, it can take two to four weeks to get back to the United States and then whatever time it takes from that sorting facility to your voting place. So we recommend that people give themselves at least a month and really just as soon as you have that ballot in hand and are ready to send it in, go ahead with that procedure so that uh, you can be sure it got in on time. Wonderful, Becky. And, and as Becky pointed out, remember you need to register first. So that takes quite a while and then, then you vote. So it's, it's not an automatic process necessarily. So, so it's important to, to, to do it with, with time. And, and another thing that you were, that you were mentioning is uh, for, for many Americans, you help them with their federal benefits uh, abroad because a lot of these agencies like Social Security and others, they don't usually do walk-ins, right? So people can't go visit Social Security or visit uh, Veteran Affairs. Can you tell us a little bit of, of how ACS uh, helps Americans uh, really bridge that gap with, with the different, uh, uh, with the different uh, federal units and federal uh, uh, agencies? I can give you a little bit of information uh, on that, but it's gonna depend a little bit on where you are. If you're here in the Mexico City region, um, we're lucky that we actually do have a, a federal benefits office here that under normal circumstances offers some in-person appointments to, to assist individuals who um, need help with um, uh, or have questions about their social security or veterans affairs or other sorts of benefits programs. Um, However, in, under the current circumstances, those individuals aren't offering in-person appointments, but just like the rest of us, they are working um, and they are still available to answer questions. So the Federal Benefits Unit is answering questions by email and they usually get back to people within a few days um, and are available to kind of point you in the right direction if you need to know how to apply for those benefits or um, how to make changes or are, are not sure about your eligibility. Um, so we have that benefit here in, in Mexico City and at a few of our other offices that have a federal benefits unit located in-house. That, that's, that's wonderful. And, and, and one of the services that people, I, I get a, a few calls uh, uh, about it is, and they don't realize is that there's, there's a, a U.S. notary sitting in the U.S. Embassy. So most, most of the regular times, not in the pandemic, uh, they can actually use a notary. Absolutely. Yes, all of us consuls are, are allowed to serve as notaries when we're overseas. Um, so uh, if individuals need notarial services under regular circumstances, that's a routine appointment. You make, a, you make an appointment with us and uh, you can come in for that service. Typically, it's for documents that you'd use in the U.S. Um, and under the current situation with our, with our limitations and suspension of most routine services, notarials look a little different. However, there are some kind of emergent situations in which you might still be able to provide notarial services. So if individuals have some sort of urgent situation like that, we encourage them to contact us at Mexico City Passport at state.gov, explain your situation, and uh, if, if it's something we can accommodate, we certainly will try to. And, and Becky, is that service, the, the uh, U.S. notary service, is it for, for only Americans or is it for, for anyone that needs any type of U.S. Uh, notary uh, process? 
notarial services are not just limited to United States citizens. Um, they are principally for documents that would be used in the United States, however. So um, if there's a Mexican citizen who needs a document to be used in Mexico, the majority of the time, that's not, um, we're not really the right notarial service for that. Uh, but if a Mexican citizen or any other nationality needs a document um, notarized for use in the United States, uh, we're, we're the right place to come for that. So you can always contact us and ask us the question and we can give you a little bit of guidance if that's something we can provide to someone. Wonderful. And, 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 and in terms of passports, if, if somebody loses their passport, uh, is traveling in Mexico, loses their passport, they can always call the embassy anytime and, and, and uh, set, up, set up an urgent appointment, right? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, uh, we, we do quite a bit of that here. Um, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of individuals who either lose a passport, have it stolen, or perhaps didn't realize it was uh, going to expire right before they had travel plans. So the embassy offers emergency uh, passports that we issue here um, for individuals with urgent travel plans who uh, don't have one in hand or whose passports expired. Um, like you said, you can contact us anytime. Uh, if someone contacts us after hours on a weekend, et cetera, uh, we'll typically ask them to come in the next business day uh, for that. I'll, you know, sort of depends on the circumstances, but that's typically what we're looking for. Individuals come in with their photo, they pay the fee, and we can usually print it up um, the, that day or the next uh, in order to help get people on their way home. Super, super. And David, I, I, I know you, uh, you have excellent Spanish, so if you don't mind, we'll switch to Spanish because obviously there's always questions about, about visas. You probably go to a dinner and they, they have 20 questions for you every, every time, but uh, under normal circumstances, of course. And uh, I don't know if my Spanish is excellent, but I'll do my best, Larry. <laughs> well, platícanos, David, un, un poco de, de, del, del sistema de, de visas, porque aparte, Si, si no mal recuerdo, la Ciudad de México es, es uno de los consulados más ocupados de todo el mundo, ¿no? Sí, oh, sí es. No, en la Embajada y todos los consulados eh, generales, nosotros ofrecemos lo, el servicio de visa y de todas clasificaciones. Hay como más de 20 clasificaciones, entonces, de turismo, de inversionista, de estudiantes, eh, lo que sea. Entonces, eh, bueno, en, en tiempos normales eh, nosotros ofrecemos citas, la gente paga su, uh, su fee y, y llegan a, a la embajada o consulado para solicitar la visa. A veces no necesitan eh, ser entrevistados personalmente si están renovando una visa, por ejemplo, pero si es una solicitud, la primera solicitud sí tiene que presentarse aquí en la embajada o en el consulado y tener una entrevista pequeña, uh, corta con el, el consul. Uh, ahora, eh, con el COVID-19, el 19, eh, estamos, eh, bueno, hemos suspendido todos los servicios de rutina, incluso la gran mayoría de visas, solamente estamos eh, procesando casos de urgencia. Eh, si alguien piensa que tiene urgencia para ir a Estados Unidos, un tratamiento médico, para visitar a alguien en un hospital, algo así, o que está trabajando eh, en una industria esencial, Entonces nos puede contactar por correo. Toda la información se encuentra en nuestro sitio web y pedir una, una cita de emergencia. Uh, porque estamos tratando de reducir todo el número de personas en, en, en la embajada, ¿no? Para, para el bienestar de, de, de nosotros y también del, del público. No, de verdad no, no puedo decir cuándo vamos a um, reiniciar los servicios normales. Eso depende de la situación del de la pandemia, uh, pero lo, lo más pronto que pod podamos, vamos a hacerlo. Sí. Y, y bajo circunstancias normales, David, eh, ¿cuánto tiempo las personas se deben de tomar si quieren viajar a Estados Unidos porque a lo mejor tienen un evento en circunstancias normales? Eh, ¿Cuánto tiempo se deben de dar? Porque te ha de pasar que llegan un día antes y ya quieren su visa, ¿no? Entonces, sí, sí. cuéntanos un poco pues, de eso. Muy gracias por hacer esa eh, pregunta, porque es importante. No, eso depende, ¿no? A veces en, en, en tiempos normales, a veces hay una lista de espera para una cita de dos, tres meses, puede ser. Entonces, sí, si tiene planes de viajar mañana, no tiene visa, eh, y no es una emergencia, es casi imposible. Entonces, con mucha anticipación, la gente debe eh, solicitar su visa, eh, pagar la tarifa, organizar todos sus... Uh, papeles, llenar el formulario en, en línea y presentarse por la cita. Entonces, 
por lo menos con tres a seis uh, meses con anticipación. La visa, uh, normalmente, si, uh, si califica, es, es válida por 10 años, motivos entradas. Entonces, se puede usar por 10 años por múltiples viajes a Estados Unidos. Sí. Y, y adicionalmente, si, si la persona tiene hijos pequeños, generalmente se puede hacer como en grupo. ¿Cómo, cómo se maneja ese tipo? Y normalmente, de... la, la, las familias eh, se les dicen la visa eh, juntos. Sí, claro que sí. Y es, es mejor, es, es, uh, es mejor para nosotros porque entendemos mejor la situación de la familia y también yo creo que mejor para la familia porque pueden organizar todo a la vez, ¿no? Una vez. Entonces, sí, así es. Y, 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 y obviamente es un proceso eh, que, que aparte lleva dos partes, ¿no? Además, si es la primera vez, una que son eh, la, las huellas dactilares y la otra que es la entrevista, ¿no? ¿Nos, nos sí, hay un, sí, hay un centro especial de atención de, de los solicitantes, se llama CAS. Uh, que está muy cerca de la embajada. Y ellos sí, ellos toman la, las huellas digitales, eh, procesan algunos papeles, uh, an, normalmente al mismo día o día antes eh, de la cita. Y después la, la persona viene a, a la embajada aquí en México City o en el consulado para, para tener su entrevista con el consul. O la consul. Sí. Claro. Y, 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 y te han de preguntar seguido, pero eh, cuando los cónsules entrevistan, eh, eh, me imagino que lo primero, una de las cosas que hacen es que esperan que los solicitantes siempre digan la verdad, ¿no? Porque creo que esa es parte eh, de, y, y, y que si van a ir por un propósito en particular, que así lo exprese, ¿no? ¿Nos, nos puedes eh, comentar sobre eso? Sí, claro. Sí, súper sí, sí. importante ser honesto, Franco, con el, con el oficial, eh, decirnos eh, qué, qué es su plan. Eh, si estamos hablando de, por ejemplo, el, el, la visa más común, el visa de turismo, eh, B1, B2, orden de negocios, eh, entonces, si queremos ver un plan, y más que todo queremos ver que la persona tiene vínculos fuertes en su, en su país, aquí en México, que, que le obliga a volver a México después de su estadía corta en Estados Unidos. Es, es lo más importante. Pero sí, es una conversación que uno va a tener con la con el cónsul, la cónsul es corta, es dos, tres minutos, entonces no tiene mucho tiempo para explicar su situación. Eh, nosotros entendemos, no es un proceso perfecto, pero es, un, es, es, es lo mejor que tenemos. Entonces, sí, es súper importante que sea honesto y franco y directo con el cónsul y, y tratamos. Nuestras decisiones son eh, basadas en, en la ley y regulaciones. Sí, sí, cada, sí, claro que es la decisión del cónsul, pero es basado en la ley y regulaciones. Claro, y, y, es, y es sugerible que lleven porque a veces he visto algunos que llevan 500, 800 hojas de diferentes estados de cuenta y demás. ¿Qué tan importante es llevar toda este docu esta documentación extra? Puede tenerlo como soporte, pero más, lo más importante es, la, es, es su chance de explicar su situación al consul o la consul. Sí, y, y eso es. Estamos, eh, solamente queremos ser asegurados que, que vayan a Estados Unidos, si, va, si van a Estados Unidos, que se van a eh, eh, quedar por un tiempo corto con un propósito específico y que van a volver de, a México después de su estadía. Claro. Y, y si la desafortunada eh, razón de que se la niegan, eh, 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 uno les explica en una, en una carta después y, y creo que tienen oportunidad de volver a presentarse. Claro sí, sí, le damos sí, una carta explicando. Y hay varias razones para, para rechazar una solicitud, pero eh, normalmente eh, sí, eh, no es permanente. Sí, la, la, el rechazo... La, Típico no es permanente. La persona sí puede solicitar la visa nuevamente, tener otra eh, entrevista con otro oficial. Siempre le damos la chance de, de hablar con otro oficial uh, para, para hacer su caso porque se califica. Sí. Claro, claro. Y, y lo que a mí me gusta siempre decirle a las personas que es, es verdaderamente un proceso justo, ¿no? De, eh, ¿no? No es infalible, como, como decías, David, pero, pues pero es muy bien. justo. ¿no? Sí, tratamos de ser lo más justo que podamos, claro que sí. sí, sí porque porque no falta el que me dice, es que yo le caí mal, ¿no? Y digo, no es que no es de que le caigas mal, eso no, no tiene no, no. Y, y nosotros tratamos la mejor de tratar a la gente bien, ¿no? No importa la decisión, si sí, si es sí, si es no, eh, los oficiales deben tratar a la gente con mucho respeto, con mucha dignidad. Y, y a veces no pasa, a veces nosotros fallamos. Y en ese caso yo quiero escuchar. Y eso y hay una manera en nuestro sitio web para reportar esa situación. Pero yo estoy muy orgulloso de mi equipo acá. Yo creo que hacemos un buen trabajo para, eh, con mucha gente, ¿verdad? Estamos hablando de 1.500, 2 2.000 personas cada día solicitan la visa. Es mucha presión, mucha gente. Y, pero yo creo que tratamos de lo mejor. Y, uh, pero pedimos también el, 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 la paciencia del público que viene. Pues sabemos también que no es un proceso 
fácil ni, ni, uh, ni simpático, ¿verdad? Eh, pero, pero es el mejor que podemos hacer. Totalmente. Y, y aparte es un proceso que si uno hace bien las cosas, tiene una buena razón, eh, que, 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 que no tiene que ser una razón eh, eh, necesariamente eh, que más que a lo mejor voy de vacaciones, ¿no? Eso es muy, muy posible, pero es un, es un proceso que, que para muchas personas, eh, es más, yo creo que la mayoría sí reciben positivamente su visa, ¿no? La mayoría de la gente sí califican para la visa, claro que sí. Sí, sí. sí porque está la, la falacia, ¿no? Que dice, no, es que a nadie le dan la visa. Yo siempre le estoy diciendo, no, no. es cierto, al revés, al contrario, se las dan a la mayoría. No, es al contrario, sí. No, es nuestro interés facilitar los viajes a Estados Unidos por, por, por muy muchas razones, ¿no? Claro. Sí, para el turismo, para educación, para un, por un intercambio, uh, lo que sea. Es, esos son los vínculos entre los dos países que nosotros tratamos de apoyar. Claro. Y, y si, una, si una persona, y particularmente un joven, eh, eh, quiere ir a estudiar a Estados Unidos eh, y obviamente hace todo el proceso, ¿la, la visa para, para ir a estudiar es también un proceso bastante, eh, bastante sencillo y, y, y positivo, por decirlo? ¿no? Sí, sí es. Sí, no, estudiante es más o menos y tiene que tener prueba que fue, fuera, fue aceptado en la universidad en Estados Unidos, presentar un plan creíble que sí, van a ir por cuatro años y y mostrar que tiene los, eh, los recursos financieros para pagar su educación. Pero sí, ¿no? Y hay muchos, hay miles de estudiantes mexicanos que están aprovechando de la, de, del sector ed educativo en Estados Unidos y me alegro mucho verlos. Uh, ir. Ojalá que po podamos procesar las visas este otoño, pero estamos, eh, estamos viviendo un momento con mucha incertidumbre, no, no sabemos, pero ojalá, porque yo creo que es muy importante que, que podamos continuar con ese vínculo. Definitivamente. Y, y, si, y si las personas quieren más información de que, de que si está abierto o no eh, en, el, en la página web, de David. Está congelando un poquito, pero yo, bueno, yo creo que la pregunta es dónde, dónde se puede conseguir más información sobre el proceso y el estatus de nuestras uh, operaciones, ¿verdad? Entonces, en nuestro sitio web tratamos uh, de, de mantener uh, actualizada con toda la información, uh, cómo puede solicitar uh, la visa de emergencias si haya. Y también el estatus el, el, el en nuestras uh, operaciones. Y claro que sí, cuando hay un cambio, cuando, eh, lo vamos a poner allí eh, directamente para que todo el mundo sepa. Pues muchísimas gracias. Y, y, y bueno, pues, ¿algún otro comentario que les gustaría hacer? ¿Any other additional comments, Becky, David, that you'd like to, to make? Uh, I, I would make <laughs> I would make the plug for if you want more information. Um, I, we we typically ask people to register for our Smart Travel Enrollment Program. I have a feeling that most of uh, the members of your society, the American Citizen members, are probably already enrolled with us. So, um, but if you're not, that's a great way to make sure that the information about status of operations or any other um, important information about situations here that affect U.S. citizens are pushed out directly to you. Wonderful. And, and how do they register for the SMART program, Becky? So yeah, enrolling for the, the, the STEP program, you can do it via our website. There's links all over. Um, or one can go to um, STEP, S-T-E-P dot state dot gov, um, and register with some basic information about your location and how to get in touch with you. And like I said, that helps us find people in emergencies and push out information about uh, natural disasters, crises, and routine stuff like how to vote um, and what the status of our operations are. Wonderful, wonderful. And we, and we do have a 24-7 phone number for American citizens who have questions about services or an emergency. And, and uh, that number is 55-8526-2561 here in Mexico. So they can call that 24-7. If it's after hours, they'll probably be patched through to a duty officer at wherever their location is. Uh, but during the day, they can get uh, basic information about our services. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, well I, I'd like to thank you both, Becky. Thank you for being with us and David as well. Uh, this has been very useful for both Americans and, and Mexicans and, and, and the services that, that the American Consulate Services does is, is, is impressive. So, uh, so we really appreciate it and I'm sure this is going to be very helpful for, uh, for many people. So, so thank you for being with us this, this afternoon.